if all the Arab nations surrounding Israel tomorrow disarmed and laid down their arms, what would happen? And the answer is nothing. If Israel tomorrow laid down its arms, what would happen? And we all know what would happen. There would be a second Holocaust. My guest today is Joseph Telushkin. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin is a spiritual leader, scholar, and the best-selling author of over 18 books. A book that was co-authored with Dennis Prager, Why the Jews, the Reason for Anti-Semitism, is considered by many to be one of the most authoritative books on the subject. In this seminal study, the authors attempt to uncover and understand the roots of anti-Semitism from the ancient world to the Holocaust to the current crisis in the Middle East. Why the Jews offers new insights and unparalleled perspectives on some of the most recent pressing developments in the contemporary world. I recently sat down with Joseph and we discussed the growing anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party, how it will impact Jewish life in America, and continued support for the State of Israel. Joseph, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've been looking forward to this from the moment I sent you an email and called you and said, please come on the show, and you said, no problem. We haven't seen each other for what, close to 18 years or so, 20 years or so? Well, I know it was long enough for my beard to go <laughs> from being black to being white. <laughs> And you were taken aback for a minute, oh. as was one of my old roommates in college who I hadn't seen for many years. And we were supposed to meet somewhere, and he walked right by me. And then he turned around and said, my God, you look like an old rove. Oh. And, but that's what happens. Yeah. Life marches forward. By the way, it's, it's, not, it's not from the early, it's not 20 years ago. It's a little less because we met about five years ago when you gave a lecture in Brooklyn, uh, your book on the Rebbe. That's all right. Yeah, it could have been much longer because the book came out in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So it's probably around that time. All right. Beautiful. Okay. The reason I wanted you on the show, and uh, first of all, you're just a a font of knowledge. I just could spend hours talking with you. You're the author of, I believe it's what, 14 books or nine books? It's some huge amount. 18. 18 books. Okay. One book that I wanted to speak about, which I think is extremely pertinent now is Why the Jews, The Reasons for Anti-Semitism. This is one of your earliest books that you wrote with your uh, very good lifelong friend, Dennis Prager. You wrote okay. this, what, maybe close to 35, 40 years ago? The book came out in, uh, in I think, 83. 83. Yeah, so you're right. Wow. You've long the right time ago. frame. Long time ago. So the question that I'm, I've had a, some media for some of the articles that I've written about Israel and about Zionism and about... Hamas and the PLO and Palestinians is, so why is there anti-Semitism? I figure there's no person better to speak about that than you. So what is it that we've seen in the streets of New York, we've seen in the streets of Brussels, we've seen in LA, during this war between Israel and Hamas, death to the Jews? Look, anti-Semitism has unfortunately been the longest hatred in the world. And I'd say it's been really distinguished by three characteristics. It's been universal, it's reached a terrible depth, and it's had a permanence about it. When I say it's universal, by and large in any country where the Jews have lived, where they have been any significant percentage of the population, And significant is a funny word actually to use, because today, non-Jews are shocked when they hear how few Jews there actually are in the world. I remember my friend Dennis was once on an airplane speaking to a woman, and she said, how many Jews are, he asked her, she seemed to feel the Jews were so omnipresent, he asked her, how many Jews do you think there are in America? And she sort of reasoned aloud. Well, they said in those days, they said, America is Protestant, Catholic, Jewish. I know the Jewish Jews are the smallest group. I would guess there are probably 30 or 40 million Jews in America. And when Dennis told her it's actually less than six, she said, well, then they all live in my city. (laughs) Because Jews have tended to exert a disproportionate influence. But But the truth is, 
it's been quite universal. And often it's been so deep that even when Jews no longer lived in a country, there was anti-Semitism. The example that comes to my mind is, I think it was in 1290 that the Jews were expelled from England. Not everybody knows that. You know, the most famous of the expulsions was, of course, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. But Jews at one time or another were expelled from most of Europe, and for all practical purposes, subsequent to Israel's creation in 48, the Jews effectively were expelled from most of the Arab world. So the Jews were expelled from England in 1290. They weren't readmitted until the 1650s. Yet during that period of the expulsion, Shakespeare created a very famous image of Jews, Shylock and the Merchant of Venice, uh, a man so cruel that he wants to extract uh, his interest uh, through cutting off a pound of somebody's flesh. There is no reason to think Shakespeare ever knew a Jew. There hadn't been a Jew living in England for 300 years when he created that image. So one feature of anti-Semitism that makes it unique is its universality. Then you get to the depth. The point I often make is there are special words that were created in English to describe the depth of anti-Semitism. I mean, one which is somewhat less offensive is the word ghetto. But the ghettos were first directed against the Jews in Italy and, you know, and spread out, confining the Jews to where they could live. Of course, the most famous word in relation to describe the depth of anti-Semitism are two words, genocide, which describes the attempt to wipe out an entire people, and of course, the word Holocaust. And even earlier than that, there was the word pogrom, you know, which described physical attacks against Jews. And then, unfortunately, a few years later, just another word got uh, added to the English language, which once again doesn't only refer to attacks anymore against Jews, but started with that, which is, of course, suicide bombers, which referred to the Arab terrorists who were willing to sacrifice their own lives just as long as they could murder Jews within the process. And then, of course, the third feature is the permanence of it. Jews have been around for thousands of years, and wherever, whoever, very often the countries that became the primary uh, countries, primary rulers, or primary religions turned against the Jews. So the Romans regarded the Jews as terrible enemies. Christianity then was sort of more important than nationalism uh, in much of early and then medieval history. They regarded Jews uh, as their primary enemies. Islam, there were real tensions that, you know, took place there. And then, of course, in modern times, you know, it exploded with, uh, with countries like Germany. But throughout Europe, they used to have terrible, you know, crusades. And we know that there was a very bad mistreatment of Jews in the Islamic world as well. So there's been a permanent feature to it. And... I think this is, is, so we're not surprised. We're not surprised by it anymore. But what Dennis and I set out to do is we wanted to offer an explanation why. And we argued that anti-Semitism in effect was a protest against three values that Judaism stood for, three pillars of Judaism. One was the Jewish notion of God And I think I always make the point, I think we make an error when we speak of, when we speak of uh, monotheism as being the major Jewish contribution. I think the major Jewish contribution was ethical monotheism. The idea that there's one God, but this God's central demand of human beings is ethical behavior. And unfortunately that sometimes gets overlooked because today, primarily, when Jews speak amongst themselves and they're discussing whether another Jew is religious, for example, they will tend to answer only based on the person's level of ritual observance. Uh, He keeps kosher, he is religious, she doesn't keep Shabbat, she's not religious. Uh, You know, almost as if the ethics sometimes could be considered an extracurricular activity. 
people forget there's a famous story in the Talmud where a non-Jew approaches Hillel, and the way most people recount the story is actually a little erroneous. They think that the non-Jew said to Hillel, uh, teach me the essence of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot, and Hillel responds, uh, he responds in Aramaic, what's hateful unto you, don't do unto your neighbor, this is the whole Torah, the rest is commentary, now go and study. But do you know what the non-Jew actually said to Hillel? He didn't say to him, teach me the essence of Judaism while I'm standing on one foot. He, what he actually said to him was, Gaireni almanat, convert me to Judaism on, on, the, on the basis that you can teach me its essence while standing on one foot. Anyway, so Jews came into the world arguing that there's one God. And that's a very central part of Judaism. And they negated the gods of their neighbors. You know, as it says in the, in the Tanakh, in the Bible, they have eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear. Uh, Caligula, around 40 of the Common Era, decreed that at every temple in the Roman Empire, there had to be a statue of him. And the Jews didn't want to do it. <clears throat> they were willing to revolt. But they didn't want to have to revolt, so they sent back word that they would not pray to him they would not pray to him as a god, but they would pray to their god on his behalf. And Caligula, for all that he was known for being half crazy, understood what they were doing. And he said, no, I want them to pray to me. I don't want them to pray for me. And he wanted the temple destroyed. Fortunately, a short, a very short time later, he died in a palace intrigue. But then Christianity came along. And Christianity became convinced that Jesus was God and had to be worshipped as a God. And it was profoundly troublesome to Christianity that the Jews, the people who best knew Jesus, were the ones who were least open to revering him as a God. I used to give us an example. I mean, obviously, this is an absurd example. Imagine that everybody in the United States believed Jimmy Carter was the Messiah or was God, and the only people who didn't believe it were the citizens of Plains, Georgia. So either we would say, look, they must know something we don't know, and he isn't a god, or they would say, if we who can recognize that he's a god, they who know him must surely know it, and if they refuse to acknowledge it, it must be because of something evil within them. And that explanation explains a very odd feature of Christian anti-Semitism. We know that when people dislike a group, they'll usually attribute ugly traits to the group. But anti-Semites in Christianity didn't just attribute ugly traits to the Jews. They accused Jews, for example, that they would take the wafer used at the Catholic Mass and poke needles in it. You know, they would like torture the wafer because the wafer in the Christian, the Catholic mass represents the body of Jesus. So it's almost as if they assume that Jews really did believe in Christianity, did acknowledge it, but they were satanic, you know, and they wanted to do whatever they could. And as a result, Jews were accused of having terrible hatreds. Uh, in, in 1610, the medical faculty at the University of Vienna certified as its official opinion that Jewish law required Jewish doctors to kill one out of 10 of their Christian patients. I mean, can you imagine how it must have felt to be in a Jewish doctor's office with nine people in front of you? <laughs> so, you know, th these crazy ideas arose. In, if you go through the Quran, the anger there is that the Jews also knew that Muhammad was God's prophet, but excised that belief out of their Bible. Uh, and they accused the Jews of giving a divine status to Ezra, who most Jews today honestly would have a lot of trouble even identifying. I mean, Ezra was a very significant figure, but obviously nobody believed that. And then, of course, even it persisted into modern times. Uh, Hermann Rauschning was an early supporter of Hitler, who broke with Hitler in the late 30s, fled to the United States, and wrote a book about his table talks, his conversations with Hitler. 
And one of the lines he quotes in the book was, Hitler said, my mission in life is to destroy the Asiatic god tyrant of the Jews and his life denying Ten Commandments. And I remember, because I was very involved in the Soviet Jewry movement, the protest movement to get Jews out of Russia. And, you know, again, it was the same issue. Uh, I, you know, they would also, you know, sing songs, I believe in God. They would sing songs about God because totalitarian societies wanted to deny God. You know, they, so Jews were in conflict. Then there was the issue of Jewish law. In ancient times and medieval times, Jews wouldn't eat with their neighbors, but I don't think that was the real cause of it. Uh, I think the cause was more because Jewish law affected Jewish values in ways that made the Jews uh, subjected to jealousies. For example, it's been often pointed out that Jews have higher levels of education than non-Jews and that the average Jew is significantly more prosperous than the average non-Jew. But where does that come from? It came from the fact, ultimately, that Jews were commanded to study. You shall teach to your children. Now, what you were supposed to teach to your children was Torah, but Jews just in general had a very great veneration for education, and that education in a, society, in a meritocracy uh, tends to pay off well. And then the third element of Judaism was peoplehood. This is an aspect of Judaism that by and large non-Jews have a hard time understanding the fusion of religion and peoplehood. And yet it goes back to the first convert described at length in the Bible, which is of course in the biblical book of Ruth. Because Ruth, when she becomes part of the Jewish people, has a four-word declaration in Hebrew. Amecha me, your people shall be my people. Elohai echelohai, your God shall be my God. And the two are fused together. I'll just tell one anecdote about that. And then I suspect you have other questions you want to ask me, and I will not normally give <clears throat> such long answers. Uh, but it's, when I was researching the Rebbe book, I was uh, given access to a series of hundreds of interviews that a division within Chabad called GEM, Jewish Educational Media, had done with people who had had any interactions with the Rebbe. And uh, it obviously was immensely useful. I was given about 10,000 single spaced pages. And from that, you know, I, I, I got a lot of information. <clears throat> I knew people I wanted to call. But also in the interviews, they also, there was also a lot of background information. So in one case, they were interviewing a man in his 80s who had recollections of things he had heard from his grandfather a very, very long time ago. His grandfather had fought in World War I in the German army. And his grandfather had been traumatized by an event. And whenever I tell this event to a Jewish audience, people feel the trauma because when you think about it, who was fighting in World War I? Germany and France were fighting. Germany was a Christian country. France was a Christian country. Most of us never stopped to think about that. Christians were killing Christians. Mm -hmm. So what was the traumatic event that had happened to his grandfather? He was fighting. He was a German soldier and, the, and a, a French soldier was approaching him. The French soldier had his guns drawn. He drew his gun and he succeeded in shooting and killing the French soldier. And as the French soldier fell to the ground, he heard him saying, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And I'm sure at that which means, moment- which, which, oh, mean, which means what? Oh, right, I'm sorry. It's sort of the credo statement of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And Jews are told that if they have the presence of mind to do so, they literally are supposed to die with those words on their lips. So here he was, he shoots a guy who was gonna shoot him because he's a German and he's shooting this guy because he's a friend, he's French. But both of them actually were committed Jews. And, you know, the thought that you would kill a fellow Jew like that, you know, was a trauma to him. So the peoplehood is very, a very important element. So when anti-Semitism focused primarily on religion, 
it focused on the God of the Jews and the law of the Jews. And a Jew who was willing to give up his God and his law could generally be accepted into the Christian world. In more recent times, as nationalism has become a very prominent dominant value, so a lot of <laughs> the modern face of anti-Semitism is anti-Zionism, that the Jews are the one people in the world who don't have a right to a country, to a country and they're willing even to accept a Jew wants to be religious, okay, as long as he's anti-Jewish peoplehood. So that, I think, has been the, the distinguishing features of Judaism that in every generation have prompted anti-Semitism. Okay. So... And you will now get shorter answers. Okay. <laughs> but that was an excellent, excellent answer. It gives a, a tremendous background. Uh, in the world for the past 2,000 or so years, is it fair to say that anti-Semitism is unique in the sense that it continued on for such a long period of time to a group of people who would disperse through the, through the four corners of the earth and virtually in every place that they lived, uh, there was hatred towards them at some point based on their religion. Would you say that's pretty unique in terms of uh, hatred throughout the world? I think it is unique. I think certain things like racism has been obviously also a persistent hatred, but there's no way a black person could get out of it. It was just a hatred of blacks, for example, or of other races, uh, whereas the hatred of Jews, Jews could evade. They're hated because of what they represented, and there is a certain heroism in Jews continuing to affirm their Jewishness. Now, the exception to that, of course, was Hitler. Hitler was convinced that these values that Jews represented were so embedded within them, even if a Jew had converted, uh, you know, he, he was still regarded as a Jew. But very few anti-Semites felt that throughout history. A Jew who is willing to forsake his Jewishness could generally evade the consequences of anti-Semitism. And it's therefore to the testament to the Jews that most Jews chose not to do that. So now we're seeing, which I think another thing about uh, the uh, of anti-Semitism, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it is hated, there is Jew hatred on both the extreme right as well as the extreme left. Uh, yes. Which is pretty unique in terms of hatred towards a group. Yes, it, it, it unifies the two. You know, it's significant, and I'm not saying the two people I'm going to mention now, I'm not saying that they're on the exact same level, uh, but both of them, I think, uh, are somewhat enemies of the Jews. One very obviously is David Duke, you know, former head of the Ku Klux Klan, and terrible in his anti-Semitism. And another is a woman in Congress, Ilhan Omar, who basically thinks that the Jews are disloyal to the United States. I assume she thinks that she is loyal to the United States. Uh, and, you know, wants to arouse ill will against the Jews, has done it in very provocative ways. Now, what's interesting is, in the mind of most Americans, they would assume that David Duke's dominant hatred is of blacks. Because when you think of the Ku Klux Klan, that's a fair assumption. And yet David Duke has made it clear on several occasions that the congressman he most respects is Ilhan Omar, because she's willing to stand up to Zog. What does he call it? The Zionist Occupied or Amer I forget what it stands for, but it's Zionist occupied basically organization or America. So there, this is the one thing that sort of brings together the two extremes. And of course, you know, you know, at the opposites of a circle, uh, they end up coming together. And this has been the very, very disturbing phenomenon. And Jews suffer for it terribly. One of the ways in which the Jews suffer for it is that a lot of non-Jews who don't like Jews see Jews as a left-wing group that bring foreign and negative and anti-national uh, ideas into a country. What they don't realize is that while many of the people on the far left 
are indeed biologically Jewish, but they're very antagonistic to Judaism. So Jews suffer from them doubly. Karl Marx indeed did come from a Jewish family. His father had him converted with his other children so that he could have more equal rights in Germany, but Marx grew up to be a vicious, vicious anti-Semite. And yet people who hate Marx's ideas blame the Jews for bringing such a communist into the world. Whereas people who are devotees of Mark, Marx, you know, see, blame the Jews for their capitalism, you know, and for their values. And you're right. I don't know of any other group that suffers in the way the Jews do from these two opposite extremes, the far left and the far right. Now, what I want to say about this is somebody, uh, you know, had said to me, analyze my feelings about what's going on in America right now. And they said, you know, Joseph, you spend more time, though, attacking, uh, criticizing the left than you do criticizing the anti-Semitic right. And why do you do that? And I said, I hate the fascist right. You know, I, I don't know if I, okay, I always sound funny when you say I hate. Okay, <laughs> I have an extreme dislike for like the fascist right. My dislike for the person who went and shot up the synagogue in Pittsburgh or people who were doing attacks against the Jews and the David Dukes of the world my dislike for them actually is greater than my dislike for the left-wing anti-Semitism. But I fear the left-wing anti-Semitism more than I fear the fascist right anti-Semitism because you have to go very, very far on the right till you get to that group of anti-Semites. You don't have to go equally far on the left till you come across tremendous antagonism against Israel and therefore ipso facto against Jews or certainly all Jews who support Israel. That's what it is. One of the remarkable things in America is that by and large, when you think of conservatives in the United States, you think of people who are open and friendly to the Jews. Now, again, I'm not naive. This was not always the case. The America First Committee formed in the late 1930s, you know, and headed in effect by people like Charles Lindbergh, really did dislike Jews, and they were right-wing, and they really did oppose Jews, uh, you know, admitting Jews uh, who were trying to flee Germany and stuff like that. But the reality today is that the far right and the far left hate Jews, but you have to go quite far, very far on the right till you get to real anti-Semitism, and the worrisome phenomenon is you don't have to go that far on the left. Now, uh, living in New York, uh, we've been seeing a tremendous rise of anti-Semitism just in the past few weeks with Israel uh, responding to Hamas's 4,300 rocket attacks on their civilian population, uh, pro-Palestinian demonstrations with Palestinian flags are chanting death to the Jews. In London, we will rape your daughters. Uh, in, in Brussels, Muhammad is coming to get you. The army of Muhammad is coming to get you. Not we hate Israelis, we hate Jews. Is this a recent phenomenon the, that Jews are now thrown in with supporters of Israel regardless of where they stand? Uh, the, let me rephrase the question. <clears throat> are these Palestinians, uh, these pro-supporters of, of, uh, of, um, of Hamas and the, PL, and the Palestinian Authority, is their hatred so great that it is not only towards Israelis but towards all Jews throughout the world? Uh, I would say it's towards all Jews who are in any way supporters of Israel. But they're not asking me when they're saying death to the Jews in the street, what my position is, is on a two-state solution. They're not asking me what my position, I could be totally against the Israeli You're government. Right. Uh, so what's, they're not seeing that. They if, don't these guy, if these people ever got real power and could do to the Jews what they wanted to do to the Jews, which is probably murder, confiscate all of our property, 
I do believe they would make exemptions for people like Noam Chomsky and Norman Finkelstein. And these I are, do believe, who are these, these the, are people? Oh, okay, these are Jews. These are Jews that Dennis and I would refer to as non-Jewish Jews. What do we mean when we say non-Jewish Jews? It means they don't believe in the God of Israel, they don't believe in the Torah of Israel, and they don't really regard themselves as part of the people of Israel. So, you know, aff affirmation of any one of those three things makes one Jewish. And, you know, there are no shortages, you know and I know, of very secular Jews who are committed to Israel and, you know, and who'll work in organizations like APEC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, now, obviously, some members of APEC are also religious Jews, but many of them are people who are quite secular. You affirm, if you affirm any of the three pillars of Judaism, you uh, will be seen, you are Jewish and you will be seen as a Jew. And, uh, and I think that's why, listen, the Holocaust was such a distasteful event that you have to be an out and out i mean so extreme to in any way ever defend the holocaust so prior to world war ii there were prominent non-jews who had no compunctions about saying that they were anti-semites i think the holocaust made the usage of that term so distasteful that they had to find another way and that's i think how anti-zionism came into the picture because unless you believe, and this would, in my view, be a very naive belief, unless you believe that after the Holocaust, anti-Semitism just went out of existence, then you have to ask yourself, so how does it express itself today? And expresses itself today by saying, there's one country in the world that doesn't have a right to exist. There are almost 200 countries in the world the, by total coincidence, it happens to be the country comprised of the people who, before they had a country, were the most hated people in the world. So the most hated people in the world set up a country, and now it becomes the most hated country in the world. So there has to be a level of willful naivete or anti-Semitism in wanting to deny Israel the right to exist. Do you see, with with your experience and your knowledge of Jewish history and knowledge of anti-Semitism, do you see this period of time where the Democratic Party has moved so far to the left, leftists are out and out calling for uh, stopping aid to Israel, putting Israel on war crimes, the duplicity of, of what, uh, or the equanimity that Israel and Hamas and Palestinians are in a cycle of violence, not saying which one is the aggressor, which one isn't. A protest in the streets, uh, random beatings. Would you say this is about as serious as it gets in the United States in terms of our history? In terms of our history, it's a very serious moment. Obviously, the reason there's a lot of fear now among Jews is because we're aware of how much worse it can get. In fact, I would bring, it's a different phenomenon now. Are you familiar with a novel that was written several years ago by the late Philip Roth called The Plot Against America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, it, there was an HBO special on that, and I read the book a few years back. Yeah, and the main plot line of the book was, and it, it's not as crazy a plot line as can be imagined, uh, in 1939, as the country was preparing uh, for the end of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's second term in office, there was an assumption among many people that Roosevelt was not going to win again because there was like there was like an oral law. And you can appreciate that term. It was like an oral law that nobody, because of the precedent set by George Washington, nobody would be president for three terms. But Roosevelt claimed that it was a crisis and he was going to run. It so happens that the Republican who ran against him, Wendell Wilkie, was fine with Jews on Jewish issues and had a real hatred also of the Nazis. Uh, but there was one person who really was different, and that was Charles Lindbergh. 
And as my mother used to tell me, she remembered when Lin my mom was born in 1912, uh, Allah Shalom, a blessed memory. And she remembered when Lindbergh uh, had flown solo to France, she said, it's hard to imagine how great a hero he was. So Roth just imagines what would have happened had the Republicans nominated Lindbergh, he might have defeated Roosevelt and taken the country in a very different direction. They would have let London, maybe, you know, England go under. And uh, it would not have been good for the Jews because he would have established good relations with Hitler or certainly amicable enough relations and not gone to war. I, I want to acknowledge, I think Joe Biden so far has stood up for Israel more than I'd expected him to. And I think Jews should acknowledge that, you know, Jews on the right. You know, one of the problems in America is nobody can ever acknowledge, it, it, it's become an increasingly polarized society uh, in that regard. Every four years when a presidential election takes place, I like to ask an audience the following question. Can you think of a single reason somebody voted for the candidate you oppose that doesn't reflect badly either on the person's character or intelligence. And I rarely find conservatives who can think of a single reason somebody voted for the liberal candidate that doesn't show them to either be a little stupid or a little hard-hearted, you know, in the reverse as well. So having said that though, I share the fright that you just expressed, that, uh, that forces on the left that often establish their liberalism or leftism on their antagonistic attitude towards Israel, it'll be catastrophic. A friend of mine, I don't know if he would want me to mention his name, so I won't, but he's a former chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. His politics are quite right of center. Uh, but recently, Abe Foxman, the retired uh, former head of the Anti-Defamation League, was speaking to him on the phone. I'm not, I'm not sure if Fo Foxman might have also said this publicly, but he certainly said it privately to my friend. He said he's living in fear that this might be the last Democratic administration that's going to really be quite friendly to Israel. And that would be something very unfortunate because the bilateral support for Israel, the fact that we could expect that Israel was not going to be a controversial issue, that people might argue with policies of Israel, but that an affirmation, they would basically affirm Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. We always assume this was a Republican Democratic issue that they could both affirm. And if one of the parties departed from that, I think that would be catastrophic, yes. But you see the way it's, it's working now, is it, the path that's going with the Democratic Party, it seems to be well on the way there. I'm hoping it can be stopped. I am involved in certain activities that I hope can be helpful to stopping it. You know what, I don't want to, in a sense, I don't even want to consider it until I conclude that it's, it, God forbid, irreversible. I'm hoping that there can be ways that we can convince people that this is a profound error. You know, there are some people out there of goodwill who really don't know who Hamas is, who don't know what Hamas stands for, who don't know what's done in a Hamas-run society. Uh, you know, the abuse of human rights is so great and I'm hoping that there could be enough people who could be impacted by that. I would not waste much time trying to reach out to the far left. I don't think anything we come up with is going to impact a Bernie Sanders or an Ilan Omar. But as I said, I've been impressed uh, so far with the president on this issue. And I'm hoping that this is really uh, you know, I, I, I'm hoping we can strengthen the forces that, uh, that, that can be strengthened. Do I share your fears? Yes. Because we're seeing this now in France for the past several years, where a large 
Jewish population, a country with a large Jewish population for centuries. Now, so many of them in the last decade have been leaving France and moving to Israel for fear of not only their future, but their, 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 their children as well as being openly practicing Jews. Yes. No, you're right. And I know that a significant percentage of British Jewry was really preparing to possibly leave England if Jeremy Corbyn, uh, you know, would have become prime minister. And thank God, you know, and thank God Jeremy Corbyn didn't become prime minister and it was resisted. And there was a point when it really looked like that could happen. Now, again, I consider France a little different uh, than the United States, maybe not even a little different, but the, France always had a very strong tradition of really nasty anti-Semitism. I mean, you know, you go back, of course, to the Dreyfus case. You go back, of course, when France was occupied by the Nazis, and at one point the Nazis instructed the French police uh, to round up all Jews age 16 and over, and they ended up rounding up all J Jews age 2 and over. So there there was a lot more nastiness. Yeah, and by the way, just to, just, to, just to add on that, as you know, that even the Nazis were surprised at the, 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 the deliverance of the French police of all these Jews. They didn't expect any of this to happen, and they were like, wow, these people really hate Jews. They're good. Yes. No, and of course, and that, uh, you know, that just further encouraged Hitler. Uh, and I re Christianity in Europe, I regard as almost a different religion than Christianity in the United States. I remember once reading that the head of like uh, a Christian Democratic Party or, you know, one of those parties came to the United States and requested a meeting with the uh, head of the YMCA Association, you know, the Young Men Christians American Association. And he was very taken aback at the meeting uh, when he found out that the head of the YMCA Association was not in any, was not anti-Semitic because he said in Europe, generally they would assert, insert the word Christian into an organization uh, to indicate that it was an anti-Semitic, I mean, obviously I'm not talking about a church, obviously a church is going to have the word Christian in it, but any other uh, uh, organization that in theory could have been a secular organization, it was a way of doing so. Now again, things shifted. In France, at the time of the Dreyfus trial, it was the right wing. This goes back to the issue you raised earlier. It was the right wing that were the big anti-Semites. The left wing weren't great, they were really not so great, but the battle was being led more on the right. Now, obviously, also once you have a lot of Muslims in France, they constitute a far higher percentage of the population. And so far, and I don't want this to get lost, so far Jewish Muslim relations in America so far have been better. It is discouraging that the two Muslim women who are now serving in Congress are, uh, are, are real Israel haters and in effect, I think, become real enemies of the Jews. Because again, the only Jews they would not regard, I assume, as their enemies, you know, are Jews who can fall maybe into the uh, non-Jewish Jewish camp, you know, aren't the Jews that they would probably esteem are Jews who are not by and large believers in the Torah and not big believers in Jewish peoplehood because any Jew who believes in Jewish peoplehood knows that if anything bad happens in Israel a lot of Jewish people are going to die I mean the line my friend Dennis Prager always uses is if all the Arab nations surrounding Israel tomorrow disarmed and laid down their arms what would happen and the answer is nothing if Israel tomorrow laid down its arms, what would happen? And we all know what would happen. There would be a second Holocaust. So you mentioned earlier that um, that countries that don't, didn't have Jews or killed their Jews or their Jews left, there's still anti-Semitism. You mentioned Shakespeare, who probably never met a Jew. 
still right. carried on. Uh, is that a phenomenon that's unique to Jews? Yeah, I, I, pretty much so. Uh, look, there are countries that have, listen, we know that uh, there's terrible animosities between Turkey and Armenia. And, and you know, I suppose what makes it different with the Jews is that it, it is always a religious issue. It's not nationalist in the same way. And having said that, it is important to note that countries where Jews were a tiny, tiny minority and where Jewish ideas were not known so that they weren't, you see, the Jewish ideas about God and religion were challenging to Christianity. They challenged the most fundamental Christian belief that, uh, that Jesus was God. And they challenged the very fundamental Islamic belief. They didn't regard that Muhammad was the greatest of the prophets. They, in fact, felt that Muhammad, you no, know, basically, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but basically what was new in Muhammad was not true, and what was true was not new. But in countries where Jewish ideas really were irrelevant, uh, like China and India, uh, you don't really find uh, uh, anti-Semitism. I think that China will do antagonistic things towards Israel is just more due to an utter cynicism uh, that they have their own reasons why they want to cultivate the Arab world. So last thing for you, Joseph, and thank you so much for all your time and your knowledge and uh, it just it, you put a different perspective on this and a very balanced one. Uh, well, before we, I add that one last question, just tell our listeners how many Jews are there in the world? Yeah, probably between 14 and 15 million, which means that out of every thousand people in the world, there are probably two Jews. It means we're like one out of 500. Remember what I said earlier about that incident with Dennis? when he told the woman how many Jews there really were in the United States, which obviously has a very large Jewish population. So they all live in my city. Jewish, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the questions I'll often ask Jewish audiences, is, I'm just curious, every year when they announce the Nobel Prize winners, how many of you look to see if any of them are Jews? And I find almost all Jews look. And then I said, and how many of you if no Jews have won that year, immediately assume it's anti-Semitism. And people all laugh. But then I point out, statistically, one Jew should win one Nobel Prize about every 30 years. But in any given year, you know, we're expecting it. So the Jews have been a very influential people. Now, does that cause admiration? Yes. There's a book I really do want to write, I don't know if I'll get to it. I'm getting older, and I know with all the blessings for 120 years, uh, not too many people live quite that long. And even if they do, most people don't produce important books once they reach 100. It's not common. Uh, but I do. I want to write a book that there really has not been a good book written on called The History of Philo-Semitism, a history of people who really like Jews. And some of them Jews don't even know. There's a woman who wrote under a man's name, George Eliot. And she wrote a book called Daniel Deronda. And in preparing to write the book, she spent years studying Hebrew with a rabbi. In the book, she advocates that Jews be given their own homeland and that they start to speak in Hebrew again. Eliezer ben Yehuda was living in Russia. He's the one who's credited with having revived the Hebrew language. When he got married, he and his wife took like an oath that they were only going to speak to each other in Hebrew. I think they were able to speak about two or three minutes a day. Now, I'm joking, but, you know, because Hebrew really had to, like, you know, for example, in Hebrew, the word eight, ayin taf, means time. You know, it comes like from the Bible, eight was a time to be happy, a time. So there was no word for newspaper in Hebrew. So he created the word eton. You know, which is similar to like newspapers called the Times. Anyway, he claimed, at least in one of, uh, in something he had written, that the idea to revive Hebrew as a language came to him from uh, George Eliot's book, Daniel Deronda. 
uh, she's a hero. In, in every city in Israel, there's usually a street named for, for George Eliot. And I'd like, because I don't want to walk around feeling every single, every person, you know, hates us. There are people who really like us and who are good, good people. And, uh, and it's important to know that. Yeah, definitely. And, um, Look, you know, it, we. Uh, I remember hearing uh, Abe Foxman speak about forty some odd years ago when I was in high school, and he says, he said the problem with uh, anti-Semitism is there is always a flashpoint, and in the United States we don't know what that flashpoint is. And I remember this was back in the days of this was in the seventies. So there was the oil, the embargo uh, after the seventy three war. And uh, there was anti-Semitism rising in the United States because America, uh, the Arabs weren't sending uh, oil and raising the prices enormously. And he says, this could be our flashpoint. And then it subsided. Uh, I just wonder out loud, and of course, we both don't know and we pray it's not so. Could this be uh, the flashpoint, uh, the, the, uh, the rise in the Democratic Party of, of leftists, of progressives who... Uh, just have such a a a ingrown. I, I can't even. I don't even. I'd rather such a visceral hatred of 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 uh, Jews and Israel. Could this be the flashpoint? Yes. Look. First of all, if you look over Jewish history, you know you don't want to sign naive. You, there was always the possibility of that could really happen, and that's all I can advocate is that Jews who identify still as Democrats, which is not, which is a significant number, be sufficiently aware of this and be aggressive and, and do all that they can. I, I'm not a fatalist. Look, I, do you remember, uh, what was it, about 25 years ago when it actually looked like David Duke might become the governor of, yeah, uh, Louisiana. of Louisiana? Yeah. That would have been a flashpoint have somebody like that and guess what suddenly jews and blacks in louisiana uh you know were working together it's true by the way so, 1977 skokie illinois marching of uh, the the um, yes. american nazi party black community and the jewish community banded together against uh racism yeah and so i think we i think a lot of jews have erred in on the liberal side and not wanting to uh, to work at all with evangelicals. I think it's been a, first of all, I think it's morally wrong. And secondly, I think it's strategically an error. I remember many years ago, I had occasion to spend a day and a half with Jerry Falwell, you know, head of the moral majority. And uh, Dennis and I had done an interview with him and we came under extraordinary pressure. Why are you interviewing such a man? And you know, every age, an anti-Semite, you know, Dennis would write letters. Uh, could you send me some evidence of his anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. You know, and I spent really a day and a half with uh, with Falwell. Uh, he was uh, speaking to a Jewish group. And, yeah, you know, I was just in the car with him. And I came out with two thoughts. Number one, I don't want this man to get political power in America. Number two, this guy likes Jews and cares about Jews. Jews have the unfortunate tendency... I don't know if other groups do, but Jews have the unfortunate tendency that when they don't like somebody, they uh, they also try and always pin that the person's an anti-Semite. And uh, Falwell, to my mind, was a great example. He was not an anti-Semite, but he had positions I wouldn't like to see, uh, you know, enacted. So we we have to be open to different people and see. Now, are there people? When I said, you see, Bernie Sanders knows enough and Ilan Homer knows enough that they're not basing their policies on truth. They're basing their policies on their pre-existent prejudices. So confronting them with the truth isn't going to help. But there are a lot of Americans who really, I think, are naive about certain things. They have no idea what sort of government uh, Hamas has enacted, has enacted, are not familiar with the fact that Nasrallah of Hezbollah, you know, has said on more than one occasion, he wants all the Jews in the world to make Aliyah, that way it'll, uh, to come live in Israel, that way it'll be easier to murder them all at once. You know, we have to, 
just make these things known and then people will have to choose which side are you on that's true and i think there are still enough people of goodwill in america that i'm certainly not willing to announce you know to to lose to lose this battle in advance and i don't want to demonize too many people too quickly because once you start demonizing people look it's been done on both sides the left demonizes the right and the right demonizes the left i remember years ago making a comment to a friend of mine uh, who was quite conservative politically and you know was very down on what was going on in america we had been doing an interview with george gilder you know gilder had a very big economic influence on ronald reagan and when he heard my friend you know being so critical he made an interesting comment to him uh he said you're starting to sound like a leftist and the the thought that came into my head at that moment was the right wing tends to romanticize the past the left wing tends to romanticize the future and they both trash the present now i'm nervous about the present uh but there's a great line of uh, louis brandeis you know who was the first jewish jew appointed to the supreme court he said the irresistible is often only that which is not resisted maybe nice. that's a good line to conclude with that's excellent. the irresistible is often only that Listen, Charles, I am so happy to do this show. I think you've known I'm a couple of years older than you, actually more than a couple. <laughs> and I've been very, very impressed with you from for very many years. And uh, and I am honored and pleased to be your guest. Joseph, I, I'm, I, first of all, that means a lot to me. And thank you so much for agreeing. I know how busy your schedule is, and I'm so glad that uh, you, you took the time and we had the opportunity. So the name of the book is Why the Jews, The Reasons for Anti-Semitism. I read it back in 1983-84. I remember I was just out of, uh, right about, uh, when I started working. I thought it was a phenomenal book. I still have the original copy. And unfortunately, um, nothing much has changed in terms of that. It's uh, anti-Semitism. You have a whole chapter in there, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. And this is a 37, 38-year-old problem, which... Uh, goes back to 1975 zionism is racism in the united nations yes that's right yeah, that's and right. we uh we actually came out with another edition of the book in like 2016 or 17 uh when when this issue was heating up yet again wow said joseph Telushkin, continued success i hope i'm reading books written by you when you're 100 plus and i'm sure they're going to be outstanding as every book that you come out with, I just keep learning so much from you. You're, you're a treasure. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on The Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.